Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, yeah, my name is Roman Nivolin. I came from Revolut. And I'm going to speak to you about functional programming for APIs. So, like, a couple of words about Revolut. It's a cool, brand new fintech startup. Brand new, like, it's working five years, but still. Uh, with thousands of employees, with thousands of uh, millions of customers, and so on. So it's cool, and I anyway have to do it because I came from Revolut. So should I speak something about my company anyway? And something about me because no one knows what the who the hell I am. Uh, I came from Russia. I've been working for some big companies like Revolut and Karim, and mostly I've been doing nothing about APIs. I've been doing some internal stuff, some core things. I've been writing it in functional programming, and neither I've been doing nothing about APIs. It's been affecting APIs anyway, because when you uh, change in the code such a way, when you change in the paradigm, it changes your API. So today I will explain you how it changes your API, how functional programming can change your API, why do you need it, and so on. Uh, yeah. Oh, and also we are doing some .NET meetups and conferences in Russia. If anyone is interested about .NET, uh, .next is not even in Russian; it's half in English, and it may be interesting for someone. So you can try to Google it and attend, and so on. Uh, anyway, what is we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about functional programming 101. So just I will shortly explain what the thing is about and how it is working. Uh, we are going to talk about how to make your code more functional because it's a bit hard to really rewrite whole code base to be in a functional way. Uh, honestly, just a short spoiler, it's even impossible to write an uh, enterprise application fully functional, really impossible. But I will give you some tricks how to do it more functional and how to give some advantages from take advantages. Uh, and Another important question, I will understand you, why the hell you need all these things? Because it's a bit tricky question, really. Functional programming is cool, but sometimes people don't even understand why they're doing it. It's just cool and okay, why not? Uh, so let's start with some short functional programming explanation. Uh, it's really hard thing to give some, I don't know, good description of functional programming in short. Uh, I like this one. I like to describe functional programming uh, is a number of transitions. So your transition the date between different states uh, and such a transitions is a core of your program. Let me explain it on a short example because it will be a bit easier. For example, you want to receive a card data by card identifier, right? So you'll have a function that transfers your card identifier to card data. It's a function and ID and card data is your states. Then you want to draw a picture of a card by, by this card data. So it's another function. It draws your card image, right? So you send into this function a card data and receiving a card image. Then you want to return a response, some HTTP response. Okay, you pack in your card image to response. And then you will have such a pipeline. So number of functions that are taking one data and returning another. And in case everything your code is doing is such a trans transitions, it is a functional code. But the important thing here, it's only thing your code should do, only transitions, nothing else. So you're doing it with pure functions. And with such a pure functions, you can even, I don't know, express an HTTP because HTTP is transition itself. It transition between request to response, right? So you send in one data and receive in another. Uh, so what is a pure function? Pure function is a core of any functional program and it, it has such a three points. So uh, if it is a pure function, it is a function that has no side effects. So you're changing nothing outside the function. You're not doing any output, not changing the database, nothing. Uh, also, you're not changing external state. It's kind of same, but still. So you don't have any global variables you're changing. You don't have, I don't know, uh, class level variables, nothing like this. Uh, fun thing, uh, when you're starting to write a functional code in some book or some article, you often see something like, uh, I don't know, trying to find a Fibonacci uh, with recursion because you can't use local variables. Spoiler, you can't use local variables. It changes nothing. It means nothing. You should not change anything outside function. Inside function, you can do anything. So that's the thing. Uh, and what you will give from it? If you will do it like this, you will receive a function that always the same input gives you same output. And it's really cool thing because if you think about, I don't know, uh, any unit test or so on, when you're writing a unit test, you're always trying to recreate all the environment with mocks and so on. In functional programming, you don't need it at all because your function always will return the same output. And it's predictable and in a level of API, it's predictable too because if your API is working like this, you will always receive the same answer from API with the same data. It sounds really cool, right? 
but it's a bit hard to receive. Uh, but what's the best point of all this thing? If you're not changing external state, you're not have to deal with concurrency because you don't have shared state at all. And really, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool this work is parallelism in this way, right? So that's the main advantage of pure function. You're not changing external state, so it's easy to test, it's easy to parallel, you're not working with concurrency, it's a good thing. The problem is that it's a bit hard to create because really it's hard to write a code that changes nothing external. How to write that database, how to I don't know, read to database is a side effect too, kind of, because you're dependent on external states of what will happen. Uh, so then I will give you a number of small ideas how to make your code more functional. So let's talk about it. The first idea is pretty simple. What if how your endpoint is a pure function? Uh, previously I've shown you such a thing like, okay, it's a logic of some endpoint. You uh, transform a request to response, you transform a card identifier to a card image, right? So it's a logic of some small simple endpoint. What if it's pure? completely. So it's pretty easy to transform such a thing to, I don't know, some C-sharp code, right? It's pretty the same thing you've seen on previous slide, just wrote in code. Okay, it maybe not looks really functional, but if you're doing it like this in a pipeline, oh, okay, now it's more functional. I can even, can even put a stamp here. Still, it changed nothing. It's pretty the same code. Uh, but what advantage it can give to us, such an organization of logic? All the functional things, if anything you're using here is a pure function. But here is a number of things that it's a bit hard to organize like a pure function. For example, uh, how you're going to deal with validations and authorizations. It's a bit hard to write validation as a pure function because, let me explain. For example, you have such a function, it's given a request or internally, I don't know, something named validated request. So you can be sure if something has this type, it's absolutely valid request, you checked previously. So it's cool, but how such a function will work what it can return if we have no valid request. So in case, in case request is valid, it's obvious, right? You're turning a valid request. Everything is cool. But what are you going to do if your request is not valid? It's a question. And for this question, here is two answers. One is fully cool functional, and another is like, like common developers used to do, some trick and so on. So let's start with fully functional thing. As far as it's functional, I will show it on some scary function language. This time it's F sharp. So you can be scared, but still it's just two slides with code, nothing hard. Uh, so in such a cases, in functional programming, we used to use uh, result types. Result types are described usually with algebraic data types. So it's a type that can have multiple states and in each state it have different data. In this case, we have two states. One state is a good result and another is an error. In case of good results, we're just having a data inside of it. In case of bad results, we're having some error message. So in case of validation function, you can just return an error message if it's invalid with some message, with some ID, I don't know, anything. Uh, and in case it's good, you're just receiving the data from it. So, and then all the functions are binded with specific bind function. This function do nothing but just checking the result of previous function, which is the result type. And in case we have some data, data this data is sent to another next function. For example, uh, you validated a request and then sending this valid request to receive an ID from it function, right? So, and you're sure it is a valid request. And in case it's an error, we just throw an error to the next function. So we are doing nothing. Uh, but there is some bad news. In non-functional programming languages like Java, C Sharp, or anything else, it's looking pretty weird. I mean, functional guys are used to use it even in functional languages, and I'm feeling pretty cool about it. The same cool as Harald. So I'm, <laughs> I'm real nice about it, but still, usually people are don't like to use it. There is a good article about it that Vladimir Horikov wrote. He have a cool mm, four articles about functional programming application in C Sharp or Java and other common languages, not functional. And in comments there is pretty much feedback like, uh, oh, okay, it's looking cool, it's interesting, but come on, why code became that weird? And that's the right answer because code really becoming weird after it. So there is Another solution, like common solution for C Sharp or any other language, we can just throw exceptions. So another idea is to use a business exceptions for error processing. Maybe not error processing, just business error processing, but still, we can use business exceptions for it. So let me shortly explain the idea. For example, in this function of validation, we're just going to throw some exception that named, I don't know, invalid request exception, pretty common practice. 
and such an exception receiving some data. In this case, we are just uh, getting the request to it because, okay, request is invalid. We are giving a request to this function and we can check is it okay or not. And then in this, uh, oh, 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 yeah change it an example in last moment, as it usually happens. So okay, another example. <laughs> uh, we want to validate some amount, right? In the same validation function, okay, we will date in it, we want to receive a return an amount in case everything is okay, and in case it's not, we throw in a business exception. Uh, what we have here, in such an exception, we given an amount to it, and inside of an exception, uh, it's uh, inherits from a basic validation exception. Uh, so itself inside have uh, just a signature that's thrown to a next exception uh, and exception message and I don't know some data we can need. So data we can need here is amount that is invalid though, so we can check it later in our API response what was the problem. Uh, then in our basic validation exception we are calling another exception so just a business exception signature uh, with a payload that we built in previous exception and some HTTP status code and message and so on. So what we're receiving from it? Uh, we are throwing exception. We got a pretty readable code because it's pretty obvious what happens when we throw an invalid amount exception with amount, right? And inside of it, somewhere, we're building uh, an IP API response with HTTP message, with error code of our internal application error code, with payload, and anything else we can need. Uh, what's the advantage of it? Is that, okay, here we have the whole signature. It's a bit hard to read, but still, just because the slide is small. Uh, so what, what we're receiving from it, we're receiving from it, uh, same API responses for all message for all errors, and we are processing it only in one place. In some place where we catch in all those exceptions, it's some global exception handler, common thing, and we are never processing it uh, inside of a code. So we're receiving from it the same API responses for all messages, and it's pretty cool because usually API error responses are a mess if it's not <coughs> built in a cool way. Uh, so then our pipeline is becoming like this. So it just adding to another function like authorization and validation to the start of it. Uh, and the good news here is that the result of authorization function, for example, is authorized request. What's good? Uh, the good thing is that in case we want to receive in some function only authorized request, we just have a signature of this function authorized request. And we can send in this function any request that is not authorized. And only functions that can build an authorized request is a constructor of authorized request, and we have an authorization inside of it. So there's just no way to uh, send to this function no non-authorized request. And that's cool. So we can just forget about the authorization. There is no such a way. Our business logic built in a way that not allows us to send rep and not authorized request to a function where we need it authorized. So that's pretty safe. You have a safe on uh, function signature level. Pretty cool. Uh, so. What's the advantages of it? Uh, the advantage is that we have a unified way to process errors. Pretty cool. So um, as the people who are working with APIs, it's good to know that we always will have the same uh, way of forming messages, the same bunch of error codes, that we'll have a good uh, HTTP error code because it's a basic of uh, such a validation exception. You just cancel a validation exception without an error code and so on. So you will receive a proper error message all the time. And in case you're, it is some unexpected exception, you'll just receive 500 error with, I don't know, exception message, and it's another good signal because when you're receiving some uh, errors that you're not expecting, okay, it's a good uh, point to create task in Jira, right? So another thing is uh, the you need to check for any error only once. So pretty common situation is when you're checking for some error, then returning from function, I don't know, false, null, or anything else, on, and on upper level checking that your result is not null. So you're checking for the same error twice, and maybe even more time if you keep returning such a null result or anything else. And it's a pretty big problem because your code becoming a mess of checking in for n errors. Here you're checking for it only once, then you throw an exception, and that's all. You're protested. You said, oh, okay, I can't work with this situation. I don't know what to do with if my request is not validated. Go on. That's it. Uh, another thing that readability became much more increased. So it's uh, much better than, than when you're just checking for an error and returning something. And you're returning this something only because uh, some upper level expecting this something. And it's kind of a contract be between you and upper level. And you have to document it, so it's a bit hard. And when you just throw an exception, it is a same contract any place. Nice thing. 
Uh, but uh, another thing is that API response become much more predictable. Still, I told about it earlier. Uh, so, okay, about some different topic, opposite from uh, just points, a bit closer to normal code. Here will be an obvious thing. Please don't forget about optionals. It's an obvious thing. I wrote it even here. I know it's obvious, but I just have to mention it before going further. Because, for example, when I see such a function that return your null, oh, okay, it's bad, bad to return null in 2K19, because who the hell return your null now, right? So we can just make it optional and, oh, okay, now it's a much better function because we're returning optional. And it sounds like fun because we change nothing, we just return an optional, but still there is a number of advantages, right? So now function signature is much more accurate. We know that it can return no result. In the case of returning no optional, it always returns a result. It has to return a result. So uh, now we can change the results of such a function so we have no we don't need to check for now all the time. We're just changing functions that can return optional, and that's cool. And for example, now it's much harder to get no reference exception, and it's all cool thing, but it's all pretty obvious. I guess most of people here know it. But what is not obvious, that sometimes you have to forget about optionals. Not all the time, but in some cases you have to. For example, such a function. You have a function that have an email is an optional field. It is an optional field because this user can be not validated. This, he, he's not, uh, I don't know, received a message to his email, not validated his email. So it's not a validated user and he may have email or not have. So this field is optional. And it seems okay, it seems kind of common thing, but anyway, it is a problem because you have to check for this email in every place where you want to use it. But in most of places you will have an email, so you're checking just in case. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, eh, kind of weird thing. So functional way of doing this is just to create any two classes. And okay, it's a bit stupid thing because you're used to don't repeat yourself and so on, to write less code, to write less classes, and sometimes you should not do it. Sometimes you should consider about the application, about not using optionals, about not using so, because your class is a state. It's an exact state. And validated user and not validated user is two different states. So you should consider creating a different classes if it is a different state, even if it has the same fields. So you should think about it. And it's kind of trade-off. What's this trade-off? So this trade-off is about uh, we don't need to check an empty all around. So in case it's an optional, anytime you're using this field, you're checking it for empty. Ross, nothing good. Uh, the type became much more self-descriptive because when you see validated user type, you know it's got them validated, right? So you, so you don't need to check any field. You just have a signature. It's telling you this. In case function receiving a validated user type, oh, okay, it is validated. Cool. Uh, so yeah, and this function signature can obviously request a type with this field. So it's not receiving some common type, it's receiving exact type it's need, exact state. And again, the function signature this way is exact transition between the states. So transition not just request to something, you transition validated request to something. And you know it is validated, authorized, and so on, because it is, because you have a signature, that's cool. But the bad news is that you have to write much more models. So in such a simple example, it's simple, but usually you're writing really much more models and sometimes even endpoints because sometimes when you're starting to rewrite such a things, you're receiving much more endpoints. What's another advantage of this is that you're starting to think about a code from the business side. So when you're trying to understand why this field is optional, you're thinking in a business way. So okay, in this step, I just cannot have this email or I can't have it. And thinking in a business way, you're creating a business task. So in this endpoint, I need for business task an email. And in this endpoint, I don't need it. So it's a good thing for developers. It's moving it to think uh, in a case of a business problem, not just a case of writing code. And that's a good thing. So okay. Another thing about this validated user class, there is still one thing I can improve. Uh, it is an email field. Why it is a string? So email is kind of string, right? You wrote it to a string field and so on. But why it is so? Only because you can use a string for it? OK, maybe you should not use string. Maybe you should use some microtype. So idea is to use the microtypes. Uh, it's also named like avoiding primitive obsession. Uh, so the common idea is that when you're using a microtype opposite from just a common type, you can receive a number of advantages. I will shortly show it. Uh, 
so the first one is pretty obvious. You can just set up a random string to a mail field, right? So such a thing is not working anymore. You have to set up an email here, and it's not an email type. And you can say, oh, okay, I can fix it easily. Boom, now it is an email. Uh, and for this, we have second advantage thing we can do. You can just use a validation inside of it, right? So and in case you put a validation to your model creation, you have no chance to create an invalid model. So for example, we have this email model creation. Okay, we have a constructor that call validation on construction. And yeah, there's just no way to create an invalid, invalid email. If we see an email model, okay, it is validated. You're pretty sure about it. And you're writing code not thinking about it can be invalid. Good news. Uh, so function signature becomes much more accurate. Again, it's an obvious thing, uh, but it's working cool if to show, I don't know, such an example. For example, uh, I have a function that receiving some card ID and returning a card. And the question here, what is this card ID? It can be primary account number, it can be some internal token, it can be anything else. So it is just some string. We don't know what it is. Or what if we want to have uh, two functions, one returning a card by pen and one returning a card by token. Oh, okay, we have to create two functions that named find card by pen and find card by token. Why? If we can just use function signature. It made for it. So boom, we can make it like this or even like this. And this way, function signature tells us everything. So it's a good case of functional programming. Uh, if you wrote a good functional code, signature always tells you everything. That's a nice thing. So ideas to consider as a result. Uh, try to make your functions and advice as pure as possible. It's a bit hard, but there is a number of methodics for it. For example, CQRS is kind of a thing about it. CQRS about separating your reads from writes and so on. It is obvious thing. But if you are thinking about it from a point of functional programming, you see the outcome. Because it's easy to scale, because it's easy to test, it's obvious. So you have to consider thinking about CQRS, or even when you're not thinking on endpoint level, when you're writing any function, just think, oh, okay, do I need this external state change here? Maybe I don't need it. Maybe I can write a function without it, and if you, it will be the same. If you can, it's cool. Now you have a function that's much easier to test, or, or scale, or anything. So please just think about it. It's not really hard, it's just a way of thinking. Uh, another thing is using business exceptions for error processing. It's really that cool thing that I consider everyone, uh, if you are not using it, just came back, see your code, and okay, maybe I can use it. It's very un universal, you can use it any place, and it's really cool, seriously. For any web application, and even not web applications, it's the most unique, powerful way in object-oriented languages to do such a small kind of functional thing. Uh, third thing is that you can use optional as a return type, and please avoid using it everywhere else. Because when you're using uh, optional as a field of your class, it can be a problem. It can, it, sometimes it's a trade-off. Sometimes you just don't want to write a bunch of different models, endpoints, and so on. And it's much easier to make one small optional, or number of optionals, or 10 optionals, maybe 100 still. Uh, so sometimes it's much easier. But you have to consider that it is a trade-off. So you're receiving some problems of it, and maybe if you just create two or three models, it will be much better. And don't be obsessed with primitives. It's another pretty cool thing, so sometimes you're doing it even not noticing it, but amount in your application cannot be a primitive too. I don't know, any message, anything, anything that has some specific, anything that can be validated should not be a primitive. You can think about it, because really, uh, usually when I'm talking about it, people uh, say to me, oh, okay, but what about performance? You're not losing much performance from creating one class, trust me. It's not that performance issue. And performance is not as expensive as people work time, as uh, errors and so on. So one validation giving you much more than one type creation. It's really good. So, thanks for your attention. Uh, you can find my contacts here. Anything that ends with Neva Roman is probably my social network profile, so you can try to find it if you need and if you want some questions. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Roman. Uh, any questions? Anybody? Yeah? yeah hello. Th thank you for the presentation. I had a question around the uh, unit testing. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have any, any pointers about how to unit test this uh, functional programming? Because, I mean, unit testing, as far as I can remember, is pretty, pretty well tied to primitives as well, right? How do you, is there, 
Does any language that support uh, functional programming have specific libraries for this unit testing, or how, how does it go? Uh, at first, it is not a problem when uh, you have tests for your primitives. So if you are creating any uh, such a type round primitive, microtype, you can test it too. So you're testing validation here. And then you can use this primitive in your microtype. Okay, it's now not really unit test a bit because you're losing a bit of unit, but still, if you ha see failed uh, test to your uh, wrapping between primitive and unit test failed, you know it's a problem with primitive. So still. And in other cases, it's working even better than with object-oriented because you're not changing external state, so you don't need much mocks and so on. Good point. But yeah, there is such a problem that it is a bit less unit when you're using types that have its own logic. That's a problem, you're right. 